Let's welcome Jerry Pornell. I didn't know you grew up on a farm. Yeah, in World War II, I was uh, basically taken out of third grade in a Catholic school and taken out to Capelville, Tennessee, where we had two grades to a room and four teachers for the whole eighth grade school system. Is that to make you safe, to keep you out of the way of the Hun? No, not Memphis. <laughs> Good heavens, no. Actually, I was more exposed to the war in the country than I would have been in the city because a lot of the farms around the place, we didn't, but many of them did, used it prisoners of war, more oh, Italian than German, as uh, workers on the farm. I had no idea. Well, Memphis in those days was surrounded by a lot of truck gardens, uh, vegetable gardens, what you call farmer's market places now. Victory they, gardens, they, too. They, they, well, yeah, but victory gardens were for home use. I'm right. talking about uh, truck gardens, what we called them. They basically made stuff you could put truck on gardens. a truck and take right. into a supermarket. And right. so, and a lot of them tended to be owned by Italians. So a number of Italian prisoners of war were essentially just paroled to the local farmers. They had a curfew they were supposed to be in, but they weren't treated much like prisoners. The Italians hadn't any great enthusiasm for fighting Americans to begin with. But it does kind of underscore the, the racism of the um, uh, internment camps because those were Japanese American citizens often uh, yeah, who were interned in the because they were a threat in the West because they were yeah. a threat. Meanwhile, actual Italian soldiers were imported into use as farm workers. Yeah, um, well, we know there were Japanese owners of truck gardens sure. too, and they continued to around Memphis. Nobody ever rounded them up, but there were never any Japanese prisoners of war. But there were plenty of Italian prisoners sure. of war, and and in fact, well, schools in those days were different. We had in fourth grade, we had a girl who was 15 years old who was still in fourth grade. <laughs> when was that because she never learned to read? What, what was that? No, she actually, she could read. She didn't understand what she was reading. But so she they just could her read back. and recite the books, if you see what I mean. She didn't get promoted, and everybody knew she was, a, I don't know, a half-wit. Is Whoa, a yeah. Village idiot. Yeah. But interestingly enough, uh, her father had owned her. She was in the, the heiress to one of those truck gardens, and the Italian prisoner of war there married her. And last I heard, they were quite happy together. That's kind of a sweet story, actually. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? it turned out extremely well for her. This guy managed to marry her, so of course he didn't have to get shipped back right, to Italy. Right. For it. The family was happy to have a husband uh, for her, and everything worked out well so were you a science fiction buff as a kid did you read pulps did you read tom swift yes starting in high school i had to be pretty self-educated up to eighth grade because i could very quickly get through the lessons you understand and we had an encyclopedia britannica out at at the farmhouse where i lived so i got to spend some time reading that that's not always the best thing you can do you know to fuel your imagination uh, uh... yeah but but it also fueled my abilities. You must understand that in those days, the Encyclopedia Britannica told you how to do nearly everything. Oh. So we decided, my friend and I, uh -oh. that maybe we should make some nitroglycerin. <laughs> we didn't think we needed very much. We thought maybe half a cup would do. Ingredients were easy to obtain in those days. Now, in reading the process, fortunately, the encyclopedia was very explicit. It said that the reaction tended to be violently exothermic. Yes. <laughs> in other I words. I didn't quite know what that meant, but fortunately, <laughs> it, expl it explained that, too. So I thought, well, it's going to get hotter than hell. We have to keep it cold. So I got a ceramic bowl and a bunch of ice and dry ice. And we got, we floated the ceramic bowl in this wow. wash tub full of ice and dry ice. And it told you the order in which you pour the chemicals. And it told you how to do that and it cautioned you not to be violent in mixing it. <laughs> And then it worked. We made it. We made a half a cup of this evil smelling stuff that gave you a headache just to sniff it. Then what'd you and, do? Well, we poured it into an empty whiskey bottle. 
Okay. And we floated that in a hog pond. Now, do you know what a hog pond is? Uh, well, I can guess it's a small pond on the farm that the hogs would water it, in. It's a pond about 50, 60 feet across and about three feet deep of water. And under the water is about four feet of exactly what you expect <laughs> hogs to be depositing in a hog pond. <laughs> All right. So, so, we, so the water is really mostly to keep the methane in. It, the, the, it, the water is to keep, yes. Well... <laughs> We turned oh, the no. hogs loose into a cornfield that had been already picked, so that was what you did. You just let the hogs glean what was left in there. Yeah, was good yeah. feed the hogs. So we turned them into there to get them out of the way and took the horses down to another pasture and floated that whiskey bottle out on the pond. And we stood about 50 yards away with the twenty two rifle, <laughs> decided standing might not be right to do, so we got kind of behind a hay bale, and um, we shot it with the rifle. The result was pretty spectacular. <laughs> it uh, basically removed the contents of the hog farm, all six feet of it. Holy moly. And deposited it in a <laughs> uniform distribution about a hundred <laughs> yards in great. Did I mention that we were about 50 yards away? <laughs> So the result, the result was there was no hiding who had done what. And, and how old were you this time? About fourteen. And so, go on. <laughs> Some somewhere in there between twelve and fourteen. Somewhere yeah. in there. Old enough to know better. Old enough to have been able to do it, and as to knowing better, I no, no nothing happened. <laughs> it was just hog. That uh, was my plea to my parents. <laughs> will understand. Nothing's wrong. I helped fertilize that. the it, fields. It, better than you think. It not only distributed <laughs> the stuff as fertilizer, but it put about an inch of it on the barn roof. And once the sun baked that, that turned out to be best roofing tile you ever saw in your life. The only long-term consequence, other than the attitude of my parents, was um, that the barnyard cats wouldn't speak to me for <laughs> afterward. But you had an experimental mind even then, obviously. I, I, I fear I did. I've, I've always been an operations research guy, you know. I, you know what an OR man is. That's a guy who knows less and less about more and more <laughs> until he knows nothing at all about everything. <laughs> As opposed to specialists who know more and more about less and less until they know everything about nothing. So, Like that hog excrement, you were shallow but widespread. You got it. That's exactly <laughs> correct. Yes, and that was basically what I did for a living in the aerospace business was that I did operations research. But you, you do understand, in those days, you could make fairly complicated models, but you couldn't solve them. We didn't have Excel. Yeah, well, yeah, computers were very primitive. Computers, you did things on a Monroe calculator. Really? You take yeah, if you wanted to enter 200 data points to get standard deviations and everything, you did them on a Monroe calculator. There wasn't any computers. In, in, uh, Boeing had a had a Univac, but it was supposedly re it didn't do much, and it took forever. You had to punch everything on cards and put them. In. It was easier to punch them into a Monroe calculator, actually. Yeah. But you couldn't invert a matrix, for instance, and since a great deal of model solving requires inverting a linear matrix, it if I'd had Microsoft Excel in 1958, I'd have been the world's greatest OR man. You would have been in trouble. <laughs> well, maybe. Well, I could, we could sure come up with models you couldn't solve. I mean, you could solve them, but you had to do it by excessive approximation. You couldn't do them, you know, generic solution to it. You building airplanes? What were you doing? Airplanes, tactics, uh, requirements. In an air battle, what do you want more of? There are no prizes for second place in an air battle. No kidding. Yeah. What you want is to figure out, do you want them faster, more right. maneuverable, a longer right. range? All of those. Fi and you have to figure out, well, you, there are very complicated ways of doing that. And that's kind of what we were doing. Also, in bomber-to-air battles, you have, do you put more money into electronic 
different countermeasures or do you use different tactics? So it's really modeling in a day yes. when you didn't have the tools to do the modeling efficiently. We had the tools to do the models, but we didn't have the tools to solve them. You models. couldn't solve them. You could build models, you couldn't solve them. So you worked very hard to try to find solvable models, you might say. Right. What you do successive approximations until you got a solution. Simplify the model, simplify until you can actually calculate it. It happens I was just working on something just before you, you, you call. Bill Gates in maybe a week ago, the Wall Street Journal, it'll be on my website, I just put it up, had an essay on how to solve the world's problems, which is basically to measure them. Right. And what he's doing is pleading for more operations research. And what I was doing in my little disquisition on what Bill had to say was pointing out that just because you can measure something doesn't mean you want to optimize on that. It's tempting, isn't it, though? I think that, that that's it's very tempting. It's often you, you just jump to that, especially if you're a data guy, because you got the yeah. data. The solution's in there somewhere. Yeah. And in my little piece that's online, I give, uh, well, again, I'm a story tell her, right? Well, let me tell you a story about the early days of operations research. I'd love to hear it. The, the battle of the North Atlantic, the submarines against the convoys. And what was at stake was the survival of Europe, of course. I mean, England would go under if those convoys didn't get through. Yes. So they put the smartest guys they had, and including some Americans from Princeton on it, but this was mostly English, to trying to model the Battle of the North Atlantic. And they came up with a way to sink submarines. You, um, When you first see you're flying an airplane, you're at the range, limit of your range. You're not going to be able to stay around long. The optimum tactic for sinking the sub is to try to keep the sub in sight for as long as you have gasoline while you vacuum some escorts in on the sub. Mm -hmm. And particularly if he hasn't seen that you've seen him, you got a better chance of sinking that sub that way than you have any other way, right? Yep. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Sounds great. So they did it and they damn near lost the war because the objective here is not to sink submarines. What is it? The objective is tonnage of cargo getting through, of right, course. Right, right, right. So what you do is whenever you see a sub, you attack immediately and make him, make him die. Come off. As his effectiveness of submerged against a convoy ship is much lower than it is if he's on the surface. And you do the same thing with every other escort ship. Immediate attack, make him break up his attack while the cargo goes on past. And lo and behold, when somebody figured out they were sub-optimizing, they were optimizing on the wrong variable, they started winning the Battle of the Atlantic because the cargo was getting through. They didn't sink any more subs after that, or damn few. They almost sunk none of them after that for a while. But the cargo got through, which is what they really was trying to do. So the point is you got to choose the right goal. Optimize for the right yeah. solution. And, it, and in education, that turns out to be probably the most complicated problem of the lot. What is the goal? Yeah, good question, isn't it? See, Bill Gates once famously said the goal is that every American kid deserves a world-class university prep education. Yeah, that's clearly wrong. You can't afford it's it. It's not only clearly wrong, it's clearly disastrous yeah because how do you measure that they've done that right well you can measure whether they've been exposed to that curriculum well maybe that's what he's really saying is every kid deserves the opportunity yeah but that's disastrous isn't it well who do you that how is, do you decide who gets all right well that's the question we've got the next question but let's first understand what the problem is. okay if i take a class that includes the little girl from my fifth grade who is uh, my fourth grader was 15 years old and she's still 15 and she's in fourth grade right if i have if i just keep socially promoting her so she gets on up into high school she's at the same grade level as everybody else in her class the same age as everybody else in her same age and grade level and i do that with everybody they all get exposed to the university prep education do you think that is going to produce anybody who is actually got a prep education or just somebody who's been exposed to it. it. Because it's a scarce resource and you're spreading it too thin. Good teaching is a scarce resource and you are spreading it thin. You are essentially sowing your your seed in both plowed and... Right, fallow ground. 
land. Yeah. You're treating your good acreage and bad acreage the same and putting the same amount of seed on both. And that is not an optimum farm policy, is it? But then there's also uh, systems like the French system where you test everybody at every stage and you only allow those who test appropriately to continue on, which seems... Well, the Japanese, which is even worse. Yeah, and that seems to stifle innovative and unusual brains. Yes, doesn't it? Because you don't fit the mold, so you don't get the education. So, but if you start with the assumption that not everybody should have the same education, you now have a classification and a sum uh, uh, problem. Right. You have to. But you've stated you the now you've stated the problem accurately, so you can solve it. Yeah. Well, you have. I'm sorry. You have an assignment problem. Do you, Do you understand the difference between classification no, and assignment? No, I do not. I got a group of forty people here. Um, military recruiting understands this very well. Okay. You got a group of forty recruits. Yep. They're already sworn in. Your job is to figure out what to do with each one. Everyone's got to be used. You can't drown any of them. Right. <laughs> That's classification. Okay. The assignment problem is I got 40 recruits, pick me the 10 best and take them, tell the other 30 to go somewhere else. Ah. That's much easier. Sure. The Army Rangers know how to do that fine. Sure. On what? Like three and a hundred get into the Rangers who volunteer? Right. Something like that. You can That's do that in the Army. You can't do that in society, though, because. Well, but you can come closer than we are doing it. Let, let me give you another example. Let's take Joe Chumpsley, who is a kind of kid who's uh, every professor has had them. He's a, a B student who works his tail off so that he can become an A student. Yeah. And he ends up getting essentially an A average in your undergraduate school. I had plenty of them when I was teaching. Now, what do I do with him? Well... If I recommend him for Caltech, and by some miracle he gets in, he's going to flunk out, and he's not reaching his potential or anything like it, when he would have done just fine at USC. Do, do you see what I'm trying to get I at? I do, yeah. And now, let's go to the real world. Suppose the kid is, oh, I don't know, black Lebanese. He's such a minority that he's given extra points for anything he, he applies to. Do you think it does him any good for him to be put into Caltech now? I don't know. Are you doing him any favors? No, but you've added a variable that's irrelevant. No, I haven't added a variable that's irrelevant because what you call irrelevant is the variable that gets him into Caltech. He wouldn't have got in there in the first right. place if he was just the B student working hard to be an A, because it's fairly easy to tell those if you're an admissions committee. It all, though, relies on a measurement system or a judgment system that is flawless. No, since there is no such thing, that's impossible. I you're agree. Not... So, <laughs> so. Well, let me point out that the egalitarian solution is doomed to disaster. It's likely to be disastrous on every plane. It's well, I a, think you could you could make the case the you could make the case that affirmative the... action is to counter bias in the judgment so system. Well, that's the point. I mean, it, you have an imperfect system, so you yeah. attempt to compensate for bias. All right, but while you're doing it, if you make it worse, it's even but leave that one out. What I'm trying to get across is it putting people in places that are over their heads. Yeah, no, I agree. It's not good for them. No, I agree. There's no it's question not about good that. For the kids you put them in with and to make it worse it tends to prejudice the bright kids who right. are doing the work. There's no question so, about that. Yeah, so you need to consider all these factors when you're coming up with an education policy. And the first rule you have to have is that every kid deserves, you might say the goal is every kid deserves the best education he's capable of absorbing. That I would agree with. Now that one, we at least have a possibility. Right. But you have none of giving every kid a world-class university prep education. Do you see what I'm no, getting I, at? and I agree with you. The, the devil's in the details, though, in how you do the assignment, isn't it? Well, and to make it worse, in the high schools, you can't give anybody a world-class university prep education if you've attempted to do something of the sort in grade school. Right. Because the input won't be right. there. Do you see what I'm garbage, getting at? Garbage in, you garbage spend out. so dang much time teaching the freshman class to read that I, you haven't time to teach them calculus. I refer you all to Jerry's uh, current column in Chaos Manor, optimization, sub-optimization, and staggering toward education improvement. Yeah, and we ought to change the subject, but I just to happen to be what no, I was No, it's what's on your mind. I understand. No, and it's fascinating, and I agree with you. And boy, the problem is, you know, in general, we don't have 
the time or space or place to have these discussions. True. Well, not, not just that, you and me, but just in general in society. For anywhere in the world, because frankly, most American TV shows would have shut both of us down <laughs> very quickly halfway into this conversation. No, I agree. I agree. And we I live in a political environment which is so polarized that uh, it descends into a shouting match before you even get to a conversation. I wrote a <laughs> dissertation trying to prove there was no such thing as right and left. Oh, that's interesting. Do you feel you succ- one, is that on? Is that on? By the way, we should tell people JerryPornell.com, and and people can subscribe to this. And Jerry, uh, support you support yourself now. Well, you still get royalties from the the, the novel. Well, I don't get you? quite a lot of royalties. Uh, Amazon pays me quite well oh, for I'm books that, that are forty years old. That I love. We have a few of them uh, right here. Isn't that here. wonderful? So I know you were you were a professor of yes. what of engineering. Jerry of OR, what were you? No, pre- no, I was a professor of political science, and I ran the pre-law program at Pepperdine many oh, years ago. Was that your uh, second career after the OR career? Yes. What happened was the Aerospace Corporation hired me away from Boeing to come down and be the editor of a thing called Project Seventy Five. Project 75 was General Shriver's project to try to redefine the Air Force. It was done in 1964, and he had two. He had forecast, which was Air Systems Division, and 75, which was Missile Systems, the Ballistic Systems Division. And we were charged with learning everything that was known about ballistic missile technology and projecting what would be known by 1975 so that force planners could come up with what the heck should the force look like in 1975. A challenging that problem. was, and I was hired to be editor, and it was my job to interview. Every, you understand one of the qualifications that you need to be in the OR game, which I had when I was that age. I'm far too old <laughs> to do this stuff now, but when I was that age, I could tool up and learn things fast. Yeah, right. That makes sense. So for a period there, I was the world's greatest expert on pendulous inertia <laughs> guidance systems. Pendulous inertial guidance system. Yeah, one twenty-four hour period. That's, theory, that's uh, pigs, Jerry. That, the pig. acronym is pigs. Yeah, pig off. Yeah. <laughs> and in those days, remember we didn't. Wait a minute. Did yeah. this go back to the the, the hog pond incident? No, it doesn't. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was a pendulous inertial guidance system as well. But the thing was, I knew more about it than any other human being in the world. Wow. Because I was the only guy in the country who had the clearance to talk to everybody in it, cool. and who everybody was instructed to tell me what they knew. That is a wonderful skill to be able to gather information, absorb it, distill it, and come up with a valid conclusion from it. Uh, I used to be pretty good at it. I was so good at it that after 75, the North American, which was then a fairly major player in the Air Force's um, air design stuff, they had a study that was in trouble that the Air Force wanted to have it succeed. So they basically went and told North American, give this guy 50 Fifty percent more than he's making now, so he can come over here and run this thing for you. Because we're tired of you f- flooping around with it. <laughs> I love it. Were you writing at this time, Jerry, or was no, this I, only reports and that sort of thing? Now I was good friends with a man named Robert Heinlein in those days, and I used to tell Robert I wrote more science fiction than he did, but <laughs> I didn't have to put any characters in. <laughs> How did you meet Robert Heinlein? They had a World Science Fiction Convention in Seattle in 1961. Uh, I was at Boeing then in the bomber weapons design unit and doing, I was a systems analyst with Boeing. I went to the convention with the intention of meeting Mr. Heinlein and also Paul Anderson. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it happened. I met them both there and we became lifelong friends. That's marvelous. So you were a sci-fi fan. I was very much a sci-fi fan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I started reading science fiction, and fortunately, after I got out of the eighth grade at Capelville, they got me to the Christian Brothers High School in Memphis, and that was the smart kid school in Memphis, Tennessee. It only had classes of like 20 in the high school, and um, boy, did we learn. And more than that, the brothers very well understood how 
a smart guy like me could be so bloody lazy because I've never <laughs> been challenged. And they had uh, the full in locus parentis authority oh, yeah. to beat the stuffing out of you <laughs> if you didn't do. And I say, but I'm already doing the best work in the class. And Brother Fidelis would say, you may or may not be, but it isn't good enough. Wow. And we're he, all lucky if we find somebody in our lives that can challenge us like that. I will never forget Brother Roberts and Brother Fidelis. They're both dead now, but they are guests. I am who and what I am because of my high school teachers more than anybody else. Isn't that interesting? Your book on, uh, according to Wikipedia, your book on the strategy of technology has been used as a textbook at West Point, the Air yep. Force Academy, the Air War College, and the National War College. Yep. Strategy of technology is dated now because the examples are all cold war and right. so basically russian but the principles are the same and as i understand it there are a couple of senior pentagon officials who are in, involved with my son in the uh, who is a navy officer in um, possibly revising it to put in examples post cold war that are more general examples and bringing it out again so yeah. that'd be nice yeah so no i have written books before and so but um, red heroin was your first fiction Red Heroin was the first fiction novel. I sent a bunch of science fiction stories to John Campbell, and he'd send them back with four-page letters telling me why well, they weren't any good, but I ought to keep writing. That's good. It was nice of him, and one day I sent one called Peace with Honor, and I didn't get a four-page letter. I got back a thin envelope, and I opened it up, and there was a check in it. So, oh, that's um, nice. That must have been a great moment for you. Yeah, or not. I and, mean, No, it was. And then he bought everything I wrote for a while after that and died. Not not related. Not related, but it <laughs> okay. happened very quickly after he began buying my stuff, he died. And Miss Tarrant, who was the managing editor, essentially was putting the magazine together out of things that Mr. Campbell had bought. She wasn't buying new stuff. She was just making the magazine up out of stuff that Mr. Campbell had bought. And she had one issue. There was so much of mine that she got me to use a pen name on some of them and Paul Anderson, who knew who my pen name was, looked at him and said you rascal, are you doing everything except taking over the editorship? Because they had offered the editorship to Paul but he didn't want it and he told them they should offer it to me and they did and I looked at what they were paying and I couldn't live in New York on that So and I knew it was a full time job, they considered it a part time job so Ben Bova took it and he did a marvelous job so everybody was happy in those days, analog was enormously important to science fiction writers because it was one of the main sources of income. But I would imagine that your day job, this is probably not something you want everybody to know you're writing this stuff. Or That's why I wrote Red Heroin under a pen name. Ah. Pepperdine in those days was a Church of Christ college, and they really didn't want novels written by a faculty <laughs> member in yeah. which the characters seduced each other. Yeah. As I said, there was one issue of Analog in which, let's see, there was a, a segment of Spaceship for the King, which was a novel they were serializing, uh -huh. and I had a novelette, and I had a non-fiction article, because I wrote lots of non-fiction for science fiction magazines. Really? On, on, on what topics? On military topics? Mostly ro no, mostly rocketry in the space program. Oh, sure. I was okay. a big space cadet. You still are. Still I, know, am. I know you're a big supporter of private space. Express. Private space and the whole business. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was Newt Gingrich's science advisor for 20 years. You know, I knew that, but I did not know that you got involved in politics in the 60s working for uh, Mayor Yorty. Yeah, among other any Democrats. See, I'm not really a crazy writer. <laughs> you were executive assistant to the mayor in charge of research yep. for two I weeks. I was director of research for the city of Los, uh, for Los two weeks. Angeles. What happened? For, uh <laughs> mayor wanted to run for governor, and I wasn't going to write his speeches against Ronald Reagan. Ah, interesting. So he said, well, in that case, uh, you better find another job. And I said, do I get a recommendation? He said, of course. So I got a position as director of research for a small educational foundation. And then I was hired as a consultant to the regents of the University of California to help develop a master plan for the California State University System, all of which was thrown away as soon as it was implemented. Well, you wouldn't want any responsibility for what it's become anyway. Well, the original plan was that there were not going to be any California State universities. There was the University of California and California State Colleges. And the California State Colleges were to be teaching institutions and not have graduates.
graduate oh, schools and not to give huh. graduate degrees, and they were to take care of the undergraduates who couldn't get into the undergraduate programs at the University of California. And the University of California was going to be much higher right. level, closer to Caltech than USC, I'll put it that way. And it was going to be just the major campuses, which is to say Berkeley, Santa Cruz, Santa Barbara, San Diego, and the uh, and Los Angeles. And that was it. That was going to be the campuses of the university system. And the state college system would handle everything else. And it was all free, of course. You mentioned in a, that your PhD uh, thesis was about the left-right model in America. American politics. Now that was in the sixties, yeah. Yes. And I wonder well, it, it, actually, how much has changed. It was filed in the sixties. I wrote most of it in the late fifties. Yeah. yeah. And I'm curious as to as to whether that model still holds. I know you have a kind of an axis uh, that you yeah. t- talked about since the good old days when computer journalism was meant something. But well, it sure <laughs> did to me. They paid me ten thousand a month for those columns. And wow, that was not bad. That's good money. And I have yeah. to say, the Chaos Manor column in Byte Magazine was what inspired me because ma- you know uh, technology writing I'd ever read that was written not from the point of view of the companies that you were covering, but from the point of view of the user. Well, you, you understand that a lot of people couldn't figure out why in the world was I better known than anybody else in the computer business. And um, they never figured out the secret. What I was, was the field? I wrote the field and stream column. <laughs> That's what it was, huh? Pure and simple. <laughs> me and Joe went hunting. Well, me and old Zeke went computing. And that, that was basically all I did. But That's exactly right, because you'd have a problem with... Uh, you, all your computers had a name Zeke and whatever, and you'd have a problem with Zeke, and you'd go solve that problem. And I loved it because it was talking about... The stuff that I w- wanted to do and was interested in, in a way that was very identifiable. I never thought of it as the field stream column, but you're absolutely well, right. Well, it was, and yeah. that was the great secret I never told anybody. Wow. And, and no, you know what? I don't know who's writing the field and stream column these days. Nobody, really, because it's not as interesting as it used to be. I could make it that interesting again, but I get, I'm getting old and I'm slow. <laughs> I mean, to do that, I had to go to all these shows and peep shows yeah, and meetings yeah. with with the research staff. And I mean, I knew about Microsoft Development Network before anybody else. Just about you were, they you can, know, the only guy who has your stature these days probably is Walt Mossberg. And yeah, for yeah. people watching, you know, this generation watching today, Jerry was Walt Mossberg times five. I mean, if you were in the tech biz and you had a company or a product, you got to get jerry to write about it that was the holy grail it worked it was it was great while it lasted <laughs> For, that's too bad because we never really appreciate what we got when we got it, right? Not till well, afterwards. But the need for it is not so great. I don't know. Nowadays, the there's an awful lot of stuff out there that is good enough. Absolutely, but I think that there's also uh, a lot of confusion in the consumer world about what to use and and do I need this thing? And and, and you know, it's just uh, and everybody's using it now. You know, it's no longer yeah. a niche. But Leo, the decisions aren't quite so critical. No, they're not. Absolutely. Which smartphone do you use? Uh, an it Android, doesn't right? matter it that matter much. It doesn't matter that much. We try to make a, uh, a big deal about the differences, but you're right. They're more the same than they are uh, different. Which tablet do you use? It right. doesn't matter that much. The important thing is that they exist. Right. Now, back when Bill Gates got the bee in his bonnet that he was going to invent tablet computer technology, that was exciting and important. And it's interesting that Gates kind of abandoned Microsoft just about the time when his fervor for tablet computers would have driven the company in the direction it ought to have gone in. And Microsoft could have been out there with tablets a long time before anybody else did because Bill liked them. He liked to use them just like I did. I loved my old compact tablet. But Bill kind of got out of that business and he and Melinda went off saving the world at about the time that... uh, And I don't say that sarcastically. He means it. I mean, here is a guy with an awful lot of money who really wants to try to do good with it. I agree. And I don't see how you can detract him for that. Absolutely. He's Uh, also one of the brightest guys I ever met. I was one of the science mission directors for Apollo 18. I didn't know that. 
Well, you say, but there was no Apollo 18. There was no Apollo 18. I would say and that if I, I knew. And I <laughs> say, yes, we were planning it, and ah. it became obvious that there would not be ah. an Apollo 18. Oh, how horrible. See, having finished the job that North American hired me for at a very senior level, right. they didn't have much for me to do just then. And about that time, Jay Worthington, uh, who was the director of operations research, got an appointment as a professor at the University. University of Santa Barbara, and he said, why don't you become director of OR? But the problem was that I am a lousy senior manager, Leo. I mean, my management style, I sort of learned in the Army. Sergeant, take that man out and shoot him. And that probably... <laughs> Probably doesn't work too well in aerospace, you see. So I, I looked at it and I realized that the director of operations research doesn't get to do any operations research. He spends all his time clearing the weeds away so that other people can do the work. And about that time, Pepperdine offered me a professorship to come over and be there. And I thought, yep, okay, I'll do that. So I was there and I worked well. And then it. Were you, not, were you a good professor, Jerry? I was a very good professor professor but that's trouble it's hard work it's such hard work yeah, it is. i thought i could find something else that i could do that didn't take that much of my time because i had a new family then and i was spending most of my life away from them because i was also director of the pepperdine research institute which really meant i ran a grant proposal mill for them because i knew how to write those yeah, things yeah 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 and so when the University of California offered me a fairly good fee as a consultant on the master plan, I took that, but that was running low, and I thought, well, uh, should I tell it why I stayed in writing and not going on in uh, civil service and space business? Sure, and then and you can, then that'll get lead into Larry well, Niven. Yeah. A religious experience. A religious but, experience? Yeah, okay. We need so, another four-hour interview with Jerry. Yeah, That's well, the problem. Well, it brings me to 1970. 72. Okay. And I decided that I wasn't making a living as a freelance writer, and maybe I should get back into the operations research business. And basically, the Army offered me a GS-13 to go to St. Louis and be a senior member of the operations research team on developing the Army's aviation program, which is to say helicopters and that sort of thing. See, you're in demand, Jerry, but I could see you want to be I home, was too. Indeed. And to go in as a, because I'd never been a civil servant, to right. go in at GS-13. Good start. At the lateral place requires the vote of the Civil Service Commission itself. It is a very exceptional thing to do. And they had voted, and I the papers on my desk. I'm ready to sign them. I was just about ready to move to St. Louis and become uh, essentially the guy who was doing the operations research on the Army's aviation procurement program and what kind of ships to buy when we had an earthquake. You remember the earthquake in 72? I do. It shook the holy hell out of the place and when it finished, I mean, it was bad. The Los Angeles Library had so many books falling off the shelves. They were asking for volunteers to come in and just put them on the just shelf. Stack them. Them. Just, just get them off the floor. Holy cow. This Is, this then, the, is that the Silmar Earth Great Quake? I'm trying yes. To yeah. In my house, I have 7,000 books, and one fell off the shelves. One. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> I go over and pick it up, and it's by Robert Morris, and it's called No Wonder We Are Losing. Morris was the counsel for the Senate Investigating Committee, which is to say McCarthy's committee. And this you and took this as a book, message. And this book is on the floor, and it's the only book, and it's No Wonder We Are Losing, and it was basically a right-wing track on how the communists were infiltrating the country, which the language was a little extreme, but there was nothing in it that wasn't true. It was taken out of the testimony that they got. But anyway, I looked at it and I said, well, that's, um, maybe there's a message in there. And I put it back <laughs> on the shelf and I didn't think about it anymore. What could the message have so, been? Wait a minute. Oh, yeah, you well, should go out we, chasing commies? Until we get to the story, you'll find out. Right. So the next morning, the phone rang and it rang at about 8.30 in the morning. My wife was substitute teaching at the time and I don't promise to be either civil or coherent before 10 in the morning. So <laughs> it got me up. And I staggered into the office and picked up the phone and uh, yeah, and a voice says, John Purnell. And I thought, well, that's close enough for this time of the morning. I said, yeah. And he said, this is Robert Morris. Wow. The guy who wrote the book. You got it. And I'm standing there. I can't believe this. And I said, yes, sir. 
He said, you know who I am? And I said, yes, I do, sir. <laughs> I hadn't until... <laughs> I just happened to see your but, book the other I day. Said, yes, sir, I do. And he said, well, I am, among other things, the publisher of a National Catholic Press publication called Twin Circle. And we want you to do an article on the earthquake. I want 700 words, and I will pay you $800. All now, right. In those days, my house payment was 400 that's a lot of so, money. You're talking about two days' work. That was dang near a month's pay in those days, even for somebody making a lot of money. I mean, I was making, what, 24000 or 2000 a month in the mayor's office. So, yeah, I said, sure, I can do that. So I wrote the article, and it happened that the magazine was published and edited in Los Angeles, and I went down to meet the editor, and I gave him the piece, and he looked at it, and he liked it, and he said, you got this done in a day. And I said, yeah. Yeah, and he said, can you do science articles like that? Oh. Scientific correct stuff like that in that sort of thing? 700 words. And I said, I could. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, I ain't going to pay you any $400. <laughs> I mean, uh, any. Um, I'll pay you $200 a week for 700 words a week. And you're the science correspondent for Miss Magazine. And not only that, I'll pay your expenses at going to things like the American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting. Very I, cool. What a I great said, job. Wow. And I looked at it and I realized that this is a guarantee of 800 a month and we could live on that. And you could probably knock that thing out in about two hours. About a day's work a week. Yeah. And it gave me time to do any other writing. So I called the Civil Service Commission and said, thank you very much, but no. And I have not had a job since. I've become a freelance writer. Now, I later on got to know Morris pretty well, and I asked him, how did you, what caused you to call me about an earthquake order? He said, well, you wrote a book with Steve Pisani, Strategy of Technology. And I said, yeah, I certainly did. Steve and I wrote that years ago. And he said, well, I called him. You understand, Morris lived in New Jersey, and he thought San Francisco and Los Angeles were close together. So he called Pisani to write an article about the Los Angeles earthquake. So Steve pointed out to him that Los Angeles is 500 <laughs> miles away from where he was. He said, but I had this young guy down in Los Angeles who writes pretty good and he could probably do it for you and here's his phone number wow so now we understand why morris called me and now, a lucky thing that, that book fell book off in the silmar earthquake then when robert morris called you didn't hang up on him well i was astounded <laughs> that's a and, very odd yeah, coincidence that's my only religious experience <laughs> in the sense that it is such an improbable event that i can't come up with any scientific explanation of how this all happened you know minsky who is a militant atheist his wife is quite devoted Jewish, but that's, <laughs> which makes for entering his family life. But Marvin and I have argued this a lot. But I said, all right, calculate probabilities. What's the probability that that one book out of 7,000 is going to be the one that falls on the floor? And he's going to call me the next day. And Marvin gave up. He hasn't I understand. <laughs> Well, it's improbable, but it, but just because something's improbable doesn't mean it won't happen. Yeah, but this is improbable in the sense of the age of the universe, improbable. Yeah, yeah it's pretty improbable. <laughs> but I so, wanted to say, I think that the nature of publishing is going to go towards, uh, obviously towards e-books, because they're already outselling paperbacks. But I think towards enhanced novels. Ah, I see where you're going now. Multimedia. So you have sketches of characters. Yeah. You have maps. You have cut scenes. Yes. You have other stuff embedded in the book to set the mood, just like sound effects do. In And you may even have music in the yep. background in a, in a novel, that type of thing. And I think that is going to happen more and more. And a place like this is a good place for somebody to go to try to find out whether they want to experiment with doing that. No, I'm with you. You have written a uh, young adult fiction. I mean, Star Swarm is for young adults, right? I have indeed, and it's selling well. Yeah. And I, it, yeah, I think it's a great book. So I'm, you're not against the idea of writing something kids might enjoy? 
No, well, nowadays, how do you tell the difference between young and adult and, and anything else? You don't, else? you don't. And I think there's a lot of people who are writing, who probably never would have written young adult, who are writing really great stuff. Oh, exactly. Well, a lot of my military science fiction stories, and not just military, but the ones that essentially involved younger people in adventures of one kind or another science fiction, sold probably better in PXs than anywhere else. Sure, of course. And that's a young adult audience. Yeah, it is. Come to think of it, 18. So I once asked Robert Heinlein what the difference between a juvenile and an adult novel was, and he said, well, in a juvenile, you can't put any sex in it because the librarians won't buy the book <laughs> if you do. And, and, you, and Robert and, and loved his busty heroines. He sure <laughs> did, and he could write sex scenes, but he wasn't allowed to, right. and didn't until towards the end when he got kind of self-indulgent and wrote these books that were far too long. He should have edited them down some, but he had great scenes. Every scene in them is great. They're just too many. It's, yeah, it's a common but, problem um, with successful uh, creators of all kinds. Very successful. He could no longer be edited. Nobody right. dared edit him. Exactly. And somebody should have done him the favor of saying, yeah. Robert, Time Enough for Love has three great novels in it. Why don't you make it three great novels instead of right. one big mess? But This from a guy who writes some of the longest novels I've ever read, Jerry Pornell. Oh, I don't. But, but you have, you have help Lucifer doing that. Lucifer's Hammer was long. I will agree. <laughs> Lucifer's Hammer was so dang long long that when they were at that time no paperback had ever sold at more than 395 and they didn't think they could make money on the book that big at 395 and they went for weeks trying to figure out could you break it into two books no we can't and finally they bit the bullet and did and put it out at 595 and it was 14 weeks as number two on the bestseller list such a great book yeah, never made number one because that crazy thornbirds. Those darn thornbirds, I tell yeah. you. And, and then that doggone woman had the nerve after she'd kept me off <laughs> being number one on the bestseller list to go write one of the best Roman historical novels I've ever read. I so, love that. I can't remember the name of it, but I read it too, and I thought it was wonderful. Well, she had a whole series of them, uh, Ground Seekers Time, and they were terrific. They yep. started Marius and went on to Octavian, and they're terrific historical novels. I right? love historical novels. Novels. You do too. I do too. How did okay. you? How did you meet Larry Niven? I tracked him down. <laughs> I mean, what happened was I decided, all right, I've got an income out of essentially two days of work a week, and I've got $800 a, a month, which is enough to pay the payments and to keep the cars going and so forth. And um, so that's a good base. Now I have to be able to sell other things. So one way to do that is that I called up Ayler Jacobson, who was the editor of Galaxy Science Fiction. And I said, since Billy Lay died, you haven't had a science editor at Galaxy. Galaxy, would you like a monthly science columnist? Huh. And he said, yeah, I guess I would. Or at least I sent him a couple of pieces. And he said, yeah, I'd like that. And he saw the, some of the... So you were doing this for, for Twin Circles, I, and then you started doing it for Galaxy. And, and not only that, but the research I did on the one would always sure. make other, if you see sure. what I mean. Oh, I yeah. always take one of the 700 word pieces. You understand, Twin Circle was not easy. Here is this magazine that's to be sold to the general population in Catholic churches, but it is read by Jesuit professors of physics. Oh, boy. So you brother will have to get things right. <laughs> yeah. you, but they also have to be understandable to the guy who bought it because he thinks right. his kid might want to know what a laser is. Right. So that was not the easiest job, as it sounds like. And then I was a science columnist for Galaxy. So being science editor of Galaxy was a fairly prestigious thing to be. So I got to thinking, now, how can I make a name in fiction? Well, the best way to make a name in fiction would be to associate with somebody who already is a big name in fiction, but who isn't reaching the potential he ought to have. Ah. And I looked at the field, at the people who were well known. Uh, it was obviously Mr. Heinlein, and I ain't going to collaborate with me, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have dared ask him. There's Paul Anderson. I could have improved a lot of what Paul was doing, and I could also have improved his business management and made a lot more money for him than he was making for himself. But Paul lived in San Francisco, and there, this is back before Internet. You understand, we didn't have any way of emailing 
thing. You had to mail paper back and forth, and that wasn't going to do. And a friend of mine, Dan Alderson, said, there's Larry Niven. And I read it, and I realized, Larry writes better than I do, but I can think of plots better than he can. Ah, interesting. And so... So I, it was a division of labor. You would think I up... I tracked him down, and I made him an offer he couldn't refuse, namely in to wit, that we'd work on this together. I'd do essentially most of the work, and I would be the guy who rewrote at the end so that it smoothed out the transition so you couldn't tell who wrote which scene. Oh, and you can't. By the way, if you read Lucifer's Hammer, oh, no, you, you can't. who wrote which scene. No, no, in fact, it always amazes me, because I know these are in collaborative novels, and yet it, it seems as if from one one mind, one voice. Really great. Uh, Moten God's Eye has sold more copies than Sagan's Contact, as an wow. example. Can you so, read those novels today and remember, oh yeah, I did that, Larry did that? Yeah, no, not really anymore. There are a few scenes each of us is proud of. Right. But in many cases I read and I can't tell which one of us thought of that line. And, I, I and, don't. and are you guys still working on, uh, on novels together? I do. But the only reason I am not doing Lucifer's Anvil, which is the working title of the next book we're doing, is because I'm talking to you. Oh, well, let's I, get this over with. <laughs> I did a thought, well, it's a little late now, but I did a thousand words on it each day for the last two days. Oh, and that's I'll fabulous. Be back at it, so. Is that your typical uh, habit? You, you get up at 11 <laughs> and, and you write a thousand words. Uh, is that kind of what you try to do? A thousand words is four pages. Mm -hmm. Four pages a day is a book in a year. That seems doable, too. A thousand words isn't a whole lot. It's not much, but they need to be the right thousand words. Ah. Not there's and if, the if trick. you understand a new thousand words, in addition to going back and rewriting the old stuff. Have you read A Movable Feast by Hemingway? One of the great novels of uh, English literature. Not a novel. It's True a, story. All right, it's about Paris. Autobiographic. autobiographic. Paris. In it, Hemingway tells how he always started. He wrote mostly short stories, of course. But he always started at the beginning each day uh -huh. and read through to the end. And he did rewriting as he went along. Interesting. And he did it in these big notebooks. And uh, so... So that by the time he finished the early parts of his stories, it'd be written, rewritten 50 times, maybe. And, and they'd be kind of polished. And, and, and everything was polished perfectly. Well, with little computers, it's a lot easier. Oh, Back sure. in the days when you had to do it with a fountain pen and right. a notebook like that. But nowadays, you read, it's just automatic. When Larry and I first started, we used a selectric typewriter. We made enough money at it that I was able to pay $12,000 for my first small computer, old Ezekiel, who used to be on display in the Smithsonian and may yet be back again. Zeke um, was a, a S100 bus CPM system. It was right? an S100 bus Z80. Z80. Yes. Right. And Electric Pencil was our first editor. Wow. And you had to hit line feed at the end of every line when you did it with pencil. Carriage return just went back to the beginning of the line. It was like home. You had to do a line feed at the end of each line. <laughs> but it was so much easier. But even so, when we went from typewriters, Larry saw how much easier it was for me to write these things on the little computer and then have the Diablo print them out that he said he wanted one. So we got the guy who built mine to build him too. That way his wife had one, he had one one and if either failed he had a spare wow and you'd use uh... well, remember niven's a doheny a what larry doesn't need any money from writing larry chose the right great-grandparents a, a doheny doheny old man doheny i drink your milkshake i drink it up oh he had oil money that doheny ah um, so larry didn't need larry immediately said yeah this is the right thing to do so he had a duplicate of mine two of them built for him he didn't get but one printer he got one by diablo half of this twelve thousand dollars was six thousand for a diablo printer in those days my wife thought i was crazy but productivity just went sky high I was able to do all that work and we first started we would print these things out and edit by hand and then type the editing corrections into the program I mean, you, you understand of the electronic text. But after a while, we got used to own screen editing, and by now, it's just automatic. You go through and you say a word that there ought to be a better word there. It's very easy to go through and do sure. it. It's he also very easy to overwrite and end up uh, making whoops. words. <laughs> uh, Bill Gates stories. What's your favorite? I guess my favorite Bill Gates story is the night that Paul Mason, Bill Gates, looked like one was going to throw the other off the Desert Inn Tower. <laughs> this must have been a comdex. 
this was a Comdex, <laughs> and in those days, the best party at Comdex was the so-called either Purnell Dvorak or Dvorak Purnell party, depending on which one of us tells the story. And you could never figure out where it was. I always wanted whole, to go, but you had to know. We would never tell anybody where it was, except maybe our editors, you know, one or two people. But that was the, the gimmick. If you could find it, you were invited, right? Right. right. And I remember one night at the desert, we had, and you understand this was paid for by Will Hurst. Right. Bill, Bill, he it, was yeah. paying for the whole thing. W William so, Randolph I mean, Hurst III, the grandson, yes. yeah. And Will was paying for these parties, largely because he liked to have big parties, and he figured John and I would attract more people to this thing than he would, yeah. which and, was true. And Will was and quite the geek. Will, at the time, editor of the uh, San Francisco Examiner. Much. Love technology. Still is, I guess, yeah. So anyway, one night, Paul Mace, who was a software writer from Oregon and mostly a guy involved in the geek community, and Bill Gates showed up at our party, and they got into an argument that ended up with literally my wife getting in between them to make sure they didn't actually strike each other. They were really unhappy. And um, What were they fighting about, do you know? Trivia. Of course, uh, as it old. was supposedly a philosophical thing. Bill's a money grubbing capitalist, and Mace was a guy who just wanted to support himself so he could do better for the community and everything. And I, I don't mean that he was a socialist exactly, but Paul thought Bill was too stingy, and Bill thought Mace was a dreamer who was going to go broke. <laughs> well, it certainly turned out that Gates was right. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what Mace's uh, product was. Oh, there were lots of utilities. The Mace and, Utilities, yeah. Yeah, Mace Utilities, a bunch of things like that. He basically did shareware. That was his right. model of distribution was shareware, and Gates obviously was not. Now, <laughs> yes. in those days, you understand, <laughs> Gates was the only guy in the world who actually believed that there would come a time when there would be a computer in every house. Yeah. And in every office. That was Microsoft's motto. Classroom. Uh, it was Bill Gates's personal goal. Yeah. Was a computer in, a, and everybody thought he was crazy. You know, I that, didn't. I dimly understood that Moore's law would take us there. They often leave off, by the way, the last clause of that. A in computer every in every house, every school, every home, running Microsoft software. Uh, that's been added later. Oh, you, you don't think that was the goal? Oh, I'm, let, let's say that he had no objection to that. <laughs> yeah, but he, but, uh, but he believed but, in the but, power but, but, of computing to change yeah, the world. Let, let's be clear. Bill thought the only way you would reach that goal was to have somebody who wanted to be rich enough to make it happen. Right. Not in he a charitable sense. By the time I'm talking about in Comdex in the late 70s, Gates was rich enough to have retired forever right. had he wanted to. To. Sure. He didn't have to. You, you, you know, I used to win bets from people in bars saying that I bet I could get Bill Gates on the telephone on a Friday night. Yeah. At like midnight. This is well before Bill married. And everybody said, you're crazy. And I said, all right, 20 bucks. Yeah, 20 bucks. So I would dial the Microsoft general switchboard and hand the guy the phone because I sure wasn't going to use my voice on that phone because he didn't know who the hell it was. And they'd try and say, my God, it's Bill Gates. He you answers know? the phone. At Microsoft after hours. After hours, he was often the only guy in the place, and wow. he answered the blooming telephone. Wow. I mean, you have no idea how hard he used to work. He er he earned it, is what you're saying. There's a difference between effort and work, of course. And I suppose I should say, you know, no, I have no idea how much effort he put into it. But yeah, I think he earned it. Are you, Jerry, you know one last different effort and work. One last question: You ever going to write your memoir? Maybe, although in a sense I'm writing it now, aren't I? Well, I was thinking that if we did this every once in a while, this week in Jerry Pornell, maybe after a year or two, we'd have the whole thing. No, maybe take a little longer than that. We'd have the whole know. story. I don't know. Jerry, it's always a thrill and a pleasure. A thrill because you absolutely inspired me in my career. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I hadn't read Chaos Manor all those years in Byte Magazine. A pleasure because you always stimulate. You're always fascinating. You're always quite a character. And it's really a pleasure to, to know you and get to work with you. Well, thank you. I'm also always stepping on other people's lines, I suspect, which is... <laughs>
<laughs> Never a problem by by any means. And we're going to have you back on Twit real soon. And, but uh, I'll let you go this time. Jerry All Parnell. Right. Thanks for joining us, Jerry. Oh, you're welcome. Have a great I, uh, evening. Sure, I'd like to do it again. I, I like doing these things, and not too often because it does use up the day. Oh, and it's exhausting, I, I'm sure. My problem but being 80 years old is just keeping the energy up, and yeah, uh, sure. this obviously uses a great deal of my creative energy in, in right. just in these talks. But that's all right. Sunday afternoon's a good time, friend, because I don't work on Sundays anyway. This morning I had a medical appointment anyway, so part of the day was shot. You know, I, I didn't ask you, how's your health is it good quite good as you can see i mean for a cancer survivor i'm i'm really spry i've um, i don't have any balance you're 80 years um, old jerry some yeah. things just have to go well especially if you've had 50,000 rads to, uh, <laughs> basically what my treatment was sort of similar to being a mile and a half from the hiroshima oh, ground geez, zero please. behind a stone wall with a hole in the wall and your head in the hole <laughs> oh crap <laughs> and that they were pretty accurate they did that very well but uh it still it got most of my balance well what so i'm I, what i'm thrilled about jerry is it did not get one whit of your of your brain and your uh, your acuity and your and your uh uh sense of humor and all that you you so that's great i'm glad to hear it i'm glad you think so one reason i come on these things is so i can see whether or not i've really really i am still functioning and i think i am i have trouble changing the subject that's all right i change it for you that's my job oh yeah I, it just takes me a minute to focus in on a new subject yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know i am the original absent-minded <laughs> probably were that way your whole life you know no i'm not no but one of the things that makes me feel better is that for all of my absent-mindedness i ain't any worse off than niven was when i met him so <laughs> <laughs> he, he'll tell you that too. Uh, you know the story about the Princeton professor. No, it's a classic story on absent minded. He walking across the common and um, he stopped by some of his students and they talked for a while and they finish and he says, uh, "Pardon me, gentlemen, but which direction was I going in when you stopped me?" <laughs> And they said, that way, sir. And he said, good, then I've had my lunch. <laughs>